So, hi everyone. Um, I am a data scientist at the Alfred Wegener Institute, and I build some of the domain ontologies that are used by many tools in um, building data environment, but other, other environments too, to try to standardize semantics of environmental systems. Um, at this hackathon, I'm really interested to see how I can shape those to better serve what you do, and if there's any way that I can transfer some of that knowledge to you to use them a bit more effectively. But this, I'm going to talk about an excurse that's actually connecting to some societal goals that are emerging and how we're trying to cope with that. So, I'm an Arctic scientist, so I work in with data with the Arctic program of the Alfred Wegener Institute, the recent program called the FRAM, the Frontiers for Arctic Marine Monitoring, and they put sensors everywhere, in the ice, on the ice, through the ice, under the ice, going down through the mesopelagic zone, down to the abyssal plain, 5,000 meters down. There are robots, there are gliders, there are, there's a bunch of stuff down there. And there's a lot of data with a lot of fields that are feeding into the system. We primarily work over there in the Fram Strait, which is the uh, only deep water connection between the Arctic Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean, North Atlantic. Um, there is a microbial observatory component that I'm focusing my work on. So when the icebreaker goes out and takes samples from the top of the water column down to the sediments, uh, metagenomics, metatranscriptomic experiments are being done, as well as microbial diversity. Um, so there's definitely a need for more uh, standardization and linked data that's coming out from themes that a lot of you touch on in sequencing and omics. Right. But again, we have to integrate that with the rest of the system. So satellite data, our modelers generate a lot of data, our uh, ice scientists, ice physicists are generating a great deal of data on the ice dynamics, as well as our deep sea systems over there that have um, visual sensors, cameras, depl camera deployments, micro sensors, and uh, multi-corers, that's the one in the middle, and little autonomous robots. One has just been retrieved from the Arctic after a year of autonomously crawling around and taking samples. So we need to integrate that all together. But uh, let's go away from the Arctic for a moment because it's cold, and uh, let's come a bit closer to home and talk about something that is connecting a lot of ecosystems and environments and their biodiversity and genetic diversity to society at large. And that's legislation and um, designs and mechanisms like special natural monuments that are here. Over here in Japan, excuse my pronunciation, I'm going to murder this, but it's a uh, uh, kinenbutsu. And uh, right, so there, there are of course ministries that are interested in protecting that for multiple reasons, for many stakeholders. Um, but we have to characterize them a little bit. So we're gonna head over there to, to Marioka, I believe. But just a little bit north in Hokkaido, there's a very interesting little place called uh, the Akan National Park, and Lake Akan is very well known um, for a variety of reasons. Now, the kinds of special natural monuments include things like trees of historic interest, giant trees, old trees, deformed trees, um, primeval forests, rare forests, so it's easy to see how environments get connected. But if you go down a little bit, it's very interesting in Japan because even individual pan, um, plants, even microbials, microbial collections, microbial assemblages, those are also things that are of cultural interest and monu monument level in interest. Um, one that I'd like to talk about there in Lake Akan are these little algae balls called marimo. Um, marimo, uh, rough, uh, roughly translates to something like a green bouncy ball or an algal bouncy ball, somebody correct me. And they, they sort of roll around at the bottom of the lake and they form these uh, very interesting, very cute creatures. And it's not just, it's not just for fun. This is actually integral to some of the uh, cultures that exist there. Uh, the Ainu, um, they are a, an indigenous group, or soon to be an indigenous group here in Japan, um, with a very distinct culture, language, etc. And they, their rituals and a lot of their religion are tied to celebrating these, uh, these creatures. So we have a real link between environment and genetic resources and biodiversity, ecology, and society. Um, lake goblins, I like that idea. So the, I know again, it's not just that the biodiversity that's in being protected here or that's um, connected. Um, during the Meiji period, there was a great drive to try to homogenize the, uh, the Ainu culture into uh, Japan, Japanese society at large. But now that's, that's been rolled back and their, their distinct cultural um, identity is going to be ratified and stipulated um, by the Japanese government. And that also includes their relationship to this particular kind of biodiversity and its maintenance. They are also the guardians of this biodiversity. It's not just the Ainu who are interested in the Marimo. Uh, the tourism sector makes a lot of money out of these uh, Marimo, with the Marimo festivals that are being held. Um, that child will have nightmares for the rest of his life. But 
it's, it's, a, it's a valuable thing. It's really connecting into mainstream culture too. And they're also sold as pets. I have two at home. They're growing, they're very small, but they're growing and they make great pets. You don't have to do anything. Just change the water every two weeks and they form into these little, little balls. If they're sad, you just give them a vacation in the fridge and they come back. So, so what we have, what I'm trying to say overall is that our um, bioscience, life science ecosystems, they're overlapping very, very much with human social systems and the access systems that we use to connect to those ecosystems, to harvest cultural, um, cultural services, other ecosystems from them, are things that need to be mapped in to understand our planetary system because we only have one. This is our spaceship going through Earth. We have to maintain that spaceship. We have to maintain its biodiversity and our own um, ecology as part of that. We're simply part of that ecosystem. So the sustainable development agenda, it started in 2015. It succeeds the millennium development agenda. And this is a UN, these are the UN sustainable development goals, which are fairly, um, quite widely encompassing. There are 17 of them with 139 targets that the countries should meet by 2030. And there are hundreds of indicators to tell the UN and others how countries are doing on the way to those agendas, uh, sorry, to those goals. So we have a, quite an interesting framework and many of them are tied very much into the environment, such as 14, life below the water which we care about, climate change, number 13. And those, the interlinkages between these goals are, is of special um, relevance to the UN. UN environment uh, is keen to embed the environment in all, at all levels of the Sustainable Development Goal Agenda. Um, we see that we need to link the environmental, let's say, factors of each goal to provide better education to feed everyone. You need a certain environmental system to support that. You need certain biodiversity to support that. And we must be very careful to decouple the socio-economic development of humanity with uh, environmental degradation. Often there, one will uh, draw from the other and uh, they negatively influence each other and we have to move away from that. In fact, it was a lesson learned from the Millennium Development Goal process that when you're trying to feed everyone, you're probably going to impact environments in a negative way. And that's something we worry about in the Arctic a little bit too because as the climate is changing and farming is moving more north, we're having more agricultural runoff into the Arctic Ocean, which is going to impact our biodiversity, the genetic diversity we monitor, the functional diversity that we see through our metagenomes, et cetera. Um, but of course, again, we have to go back to humanity. We're linked into that. Local livelihoods that we see, economic development are also tied to that. Things like the Nagoya Protocol for genetic resources, um, bioprospecting, bio it's all linked to that. And we have to think about the environment at the core of that. Uh, another thing that's quite popular in Japan, I believe, um, is, uh, excuse my pronunciation again, but uh, Shinrin Yoku. Yeah? Okay. So that's uh, forest bathing. There are 44 uh, official forest bathing forests in Japan, and the results are pretty good. So it's, uh, it's, it's cheap therapy. Um, you get quite a lot of good psychological uh, therapy by performing this function, but you need a forest. And that's not a forest. These are semantic battlefields. These are, people are, people are going for the people are competing for these things. When we look at an example from Lund, this is just a little survey. He's now turned this into a running paper that he's updating. In the bottom corner there, there was, at that time, there were 1,600 official definitions of what a forest is. Depending on who you are, you want a forest to be a different thing. So when I'm, when I'm developing Envo, I, I have a lot of stress about this because I, I, that's, that's difficult to parse for various regions. The, the Food and Agriculture Organization definition of forest it includes things like roads and tracts. I mean, there are very good reasons that these definitions include those things, but it's not immediately apparent. People don't think about that when they think about forest, but it's in there. There are also some things that are, to me, worrying. For example, rubberwood plantations and cork oak stands. They're included in forest coverage. But at the same time, this definition is supposed to exclude land used for agricultural practices. And other organizations are not happy about that. The WWF was keen to point out that it was a lot of um, lobbying from the Malaysian government that has a lot of rubberwood plantations to include that in the forest definition. Now, many ecologists certainly don't do that. And we have to be clear on the semantic layer what kind of forest we're talking about and you know, from which perspective. At least then we can link data to the appropriate kind of entity so that policy analysts and makers can also use it. They're very interested in trying to uh, decouple those things. So again, I'm an Arctic scientist. Why do I worry about this? Well, the SDGs, they also connect to the Arctic, of course. For example, here it's about marine protected areas. And that's a very similar conversation to forests. So I'm working with uh, Miriam Grace um, at the University of Sheffield to try to get into the policy just narrative of what a marine pro protected area is. So we can talk about data systems like UNEP Environment Live 
um, and to find out what that graph actually means. So there we go. We have to find that and unpack semantically all of these terms and to find out what these, these indicators are. Right now, we don't have ontologies to do that well. Um, at least there are MPAs up in the Arctic, so we can connect some data to them. But for other goals and targets, for example, uh, eutrophication and plastic debris, there's no data in the Arctic, and that's coastal. We don't have coasts, we have ice mostly in the central Arctic. So what do we do? How do we link our data to that? Because in the deep sea, now here we're like thousands of meters down, there's plastic. There's plastic all over. Microfibers in freshly fallen snow, there are plastic microfibers that we're finding up there. So we need to link that to the development agenda because that's important, but it's not there when the goals were negotiated and indicators were negotiated. So we need an interface ontology to link all of our data that's coming in from our various people to ocean health indicators and other things that policy analysts are looking at. Um, so I was very happy to be invited by UN Environment to develop an ontology to interface things with the sustainable development goals. So um, ENVO has now become very closely tied to that and integrated into that. So it's pulling in um, the expressive power to talk about things like cultural ecosystem services. What does it mean when they say healthy ocean? What is a resilient food system? And trying to link them together. And this is multicolored for a very good reason. You need many ontologies to do this. You can't do this with one ontology, which is again why I'm quite happy that ENVO is part of a federation of ontologies, which have to be extended much further than their original biomedical scope. And we take what is there, this sort of woven together interoperable semantic layer, and add that SDGIO layer to it to connect things to the sustainable development goals. But we need more ontologies. And so recently in the past couple of years, Ontologies like the Agronomy Ontology, EcoCore for Ecological Entities, the Food Ontology, have come out of ENVO, um, and now they're their own artifacts, and we have collaborators that are in the um, implementation phase, like the CGIAR for agriculture, and they're very interested in implementing these as field books to monitor how the world is feeding itself. Um, there are many more. The Earth Microbiome Project, for example, came to us and said, let's integrate some data to link our 10,000 or so metagenomes um, into the somatic layer using our expression. And we said, sure, we'll do that. And we, we, you cannot be territorial because, well, the objective is too important right now to focus so much on being territorial. So we're happy to give away governance of parts of ENVO to the right people as long as, and coordinate the uh, technical layer to make sure that it's not going to drift and be destabilized overall. We're also coordinating and aligning to the recently relaunched semantic web for Earth Systems, the SWEET ontology, which is now under the guardianship of the ESIP, so the um, that is the Earth Science Information Partnership. That's NASA, NOAA, USGS, and others. And uh, Lewis McGibbon is now leading the re-animation re, um, of SWEET. And we're going to do close alignment with ENVO to connect biology, life science, biomedicine to, to uh, Earth science, society, and the other fields. Food on will take off. Rob, uh, Rob Bundorf is also involved in that. That's very much in integrating the food world and perhaps the foundation of the Internet of Food. So. Again, there are data services coming up. UN Environment is running this environment life process that's connecting up world data assessments, etc. And they're starting to tag things with the SDGIO. They're still learning how to use it. It's, it's, uh, some, this linked data environment is new to them, but they're very interested in getting expertise into that domain. So this group, for example, has a great potential to impact the SDG agenda, at least on the data side. There are other uh, partnerships, for example, the Data for SDGs partnership is live and they're coming up with very innovative solutions and it's something to definitely think about interfacing with in our semantic technologies. Again, we were very happy that once we did that, I, I never expected to see so quickly ontology as a big old panel in the UN environment system, but that's, that's SDGIO pulling in the other ontologies like ENVO, FUDON, AGRO, and everything else that we're federated with. So again, it's, it's very encouraging to see that there is an interest, but we certainly need more action and activity around that and more knowledge from people in the policy domain to actually do that adequately. So again, I'm, I'll just close with that, that yes, we are engineering a data system, a semantic system, a knowledge system for a very big purpose, you know, where it's, it's actually helping us pilot spaceship Earth. We need good data for that. You need to know when your life support systems are um, being compromised. And you know, we have, to, we have to think about that because we want a healthy planet and we want healthy people. And we want happy people too, very happy people. So uh, with that, I thank you very much for your attention.